Canada, a people's history. Proudly presented with the corporate partnership support of Sun Life Financial. Bell Canada Enterprises. And the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Tonight, the English and French networks of the CBC continue the first history of Canada for the television age. It is a story which has seen a vast continent of First Nations become the battlefield of rival empires. whose descendants would forge a new country. A country which will become the shores of hope for millions. All the events portrayed in this series actually happened. All the people you see actually lived. All the words they speak were spoken or written by them. Wish us well on our long journey. And do not forget us. Pray for us so that we may arrive safely at the promised land. This is the story of one of the great human migrations in history, of the landless and the dispossessed, driven by hunger and by hope to a turbulent adventure in a landscape of terrifying beauty. This is the story of how their children will return to the old world and in the crucible of war take their place among nations. A wonderful success. Every line was captured on time, every battalion doing equally well. The grandest day the Corps has ever had. The attack was carried out exactly as planned. It's a story of dreamers and prophets, reformers and revolutionaries, of ordinary people facing physical calamity, economic collapse and political persecution. It's the story of the lust for gold, the battle for human dignity, and the shaping of a new century. A new century in which Quebecers will ask if they have a place in Canada. And two champions will emerge who will transform the country. And the faith of Quebec is in Canada. It is a human drama which begins 120 years ago when the West was still young and the Indian nations controlled the great frontier. Where an infant dominion is finally tied by a ribbon of steel from sea to sea. And where two worlds will collide in rebellion in the last battle on Canadian soil. Oh my God, grant us the favor so that we beat them one after another.
In 1863, Methodist missionaries set out to find an ancient, sacred stone on the vast western plains. The stone is worshipped by the people who live here, the Blackfoot, the Blood, and the Cree. Legends claim it came to earth in a blazing fireball. Stone wasn't made by an earth human. It came from the sky. It brought a message from the Creator to the people. The Blackfoot call the land Nitawa Sinani, all that is important to us, and believe that the stone had been sent to protect it. To the missionaries, it is simply a heathen idol to be destroyed. The white man said we prayed to false gods. The removal stripped away everything that identified us to Mother Earth. We couldn't relay messages to the Creator anymore. The removal of the stone was a sign of the coming of the white man. Without their sacred stone, the medicine men predict disasters of pestilence, famine, and war. The apocalypse begins three years later. White traders begin appearing in numbers never seen before, Americans moving north from Montana. At first, their wagon trains bring guns, blankets, and cooking utensils to trade for buffalo robes. But soon, the trading forts stock mainly whiskey. It is an evil mixture of grain alcohol, chewing tobacco, hot pepper, soap, molasses, and red ink. For whiskey traders like W.C. Gladstone, it is ideal, cheap, addictive and endlessly profitable. Each of us was in charge of a kettle mixed with rum, and every Indian was given a dram of fire water by way of a starter. Speech making followed, washed down by another dram, then another drink, until every man jack of them had absorbed five drams and was ripe for business. The week's trade left us with 600 horses, and our warehouse is very nearly filled. A powerful Blackfoot chief named Crowfoot had fought many battles for his people, but this is an enemy he could not defeat. The whiskey brought among us by the traders is fast killing us off. We are powerless before this evil. We are unable to resist the temptation to drink when brought in contact with the white man's water. Our horses, buffalo robes, and other articles of trade go for whiskey. By the early 1870s, more than a dozen whiskey forts have been built on Blackfoot territory, and that poses a problem not only for Crowfoot. The new Dominion of Canada has just taken control of the vast Northwest, millions of acres stretching from the Red River to the Rocky Mountains. In Ottawa, Prime Minister John A. Macdonald is alarmed by reports of Americans streaming into his new territory. It is quite evident to me that the United States will do all they can short of war to get possession of the Western Territory. And we must take immediate and vigorous steps to counteract them. He orders 300 men of the newly formed Northwest Mounted Police to march west. MacDonald had seen the Americans take land from Mexico and Great Britain and intends to keep them out of the Canadian Northwest. He also sends a Methodist missionary, Reverend John McDougall, to assure Crowfoot that the police come as friends. I told them of the purpose of their coming. 
tribal war was to be suppressed, and whiskey trading, horse stealing, and all crimes were to be done away with. I exalted British justice and made much of the equality of men in the eyes of the law. Though weakened by alcohol and disease, the Blackfoot are still a powerful military force. But Crowfoot decides that he needs an ally, not a war. He accepts the hand of friendship. My brother, your words make me glad. We want peace. What do you tell us about this strong power which will govern with good law? and treat the Indian the same as the white man makes us glad to hear. My brother, I believe you and am thankful. The Northwest Mounted Police quickly chase the whiskey traders back to Montana. It's only then that a mounted police commander, Colonel James McLeod, suggests the government has other intentions. Today, a very fine old Indian, Crowfoot of the Blackfoot, paid me a visit and others are to be here in a week. I shall explain to them the general ideas of laws for whites and Indians and that we do not come to take land. The government will speak to them about the matter first. The arrival of the police is the first step of an ambitious plan to populate the West with white settlers. Soon the first pioneers are moving across the land. There are young men like Johnny McDougall, eager to make the West their home. Often when lying under the carts during the night as we were camped, we wondered if that day would come in our lifetime when those prairies would be dotted with towns and villages, and those vacant fertile lands would be settled upon, producing the crops they were capable of yielding. For the young nation of Canada, taking the West is the key to completing a country that will stretch from sea to sea. For the Indians, the predictions that followed the loss of the sacred stone would all come true within 20 years. Pamphlets sent by the millions throughout Canada and Europe declare the opening of the Canadian West and promise unlimited opportunity. To Jenny Plaxton's family, it is an irresistible proposition. We farmed in London for three years and then went to Ottawa. We lived there nine years. Then the Manitoba fever came and my husband caught it badly. He pulled up his stakes and came out west. The West offers an escape from the economic depression gripping the rest of Canada. Farms are failing and in the cities and towns of the East, people are desperate for work. Newspapers describe the grim conditions. We are going through a painful crisis. Workers are almost without work. Factories are closing, one after another. Workers only get to work two or three days a week. Competition for jobs is fierce. Women toil in textile factories or take in piecework at home. Children are routinely exploited. 
There are examples of children under 10 years of age working a 10-hour day for $1.25 or $1.50 a week, who, when Saturday arrives, after having given a 60 hours of work to their master, owe a 75-cent balance because of the fines imposed on them. Most factories run on water power. When the rivers freeze, the factories close and families face the long winter with no work. One popular song of the times is called Homeless Tonight. Long and weary through the streets we wander for we have no place to lay our heads. As the depression deepens, there is a food riot in Montreal. In Ottawa, Peter Bowles is among hundreds of unemployed men who mob City Hall, demanding relief. I am a man with a big family of 12 and have no work. I had a little money saved up and managed to bring myself through the winter on one meal a day. I've no money now and must have work or have something to eat. In Ottawa, the Depression is taking its toll on Alexander Mackenzie, who had the bad luck to be elected Prime Minister just as it took hold. Sir John A. Macdonald, now in opposition after scandal had toppled his government, uses the Depression to flay the Liberal administration. You have ruined our trade. You have destroyed manufacturers. You have shaken our credit. You have deprived our workmen of work. You have forced our factories to work only at half or quarter time. A growing number of Canadians are voting with their feet. In the 1870s, more people actually leave the country than come to it. Many go south to pursue the American dream, the prospect of free homesteads and a fresh start. But others hear the call of the Canadian West. Pamphlet writers like Charles Mayer call it the greatest wheat-growing region of the entire British Empire. It is the tiller of the soil who lays the foundations of empire. The free husbandmen of the West who covered the prairies with sustaining gold and after a terrific struggle proclaimed with the truth of sunlight, wheat is empire. Johnny McDougall is an early believer in the promise of the West. He has a talent for selling and runs a lucrative business hauling trade goods along the Carlton Trail from Winnipeg to Fort Edmonton. But it's a lonely life. He spends the long winter nights writing love letters to his sweetheart back home in Ontario. I am all alone tonight, sitting by the chimney. It is cold and stormy outside, and the wind is whistling around the corners of the house. Oh, how I would like to be with you again for one evening, to hear you play and sing some of the old songs and have a quiet talk with you. Levisa was 26 when she agreed to marry Johnny McDougall. Just before leaving Ontario, Levisa prepares for life as a pioneer. She has all her teeth pulled and a complete set of dentures made. There are plenty of dreams in the great Northwest, but no dentists. Spread out along the Red River, the ramshackle settlement of Winnipeg has become the gateway to the Northwestern frontier. Along its muddy streets, the newly arrived settlers buy supplies before heading out to their new homesteads. 
Most come from Ontario, and many are members of the Orange Lodge, British Empire patriots, Protestants with little tolerance for Catholics or anyone who speaks French. Across the river from Protestant Winnipeg is the Métis settlement of St. Boniface. Louis Goulet grew up in one of the small Métis communities dotted along the banks of the Red River. In 1870, when Manitoba entered Confederation, Goulet and his French-speaking Catholic community were guaranteed equal rights with the English-speaking pioneers. That is the legacy of Louis Riel and the Red River resistance. But it will only endure if the English and French-speaking populations remain equal. Now that balance is quickly shifting. Newcomers were eagerly sowing racial and religious conflict. These emigrants from Ontario looked as if their one dream in life was to make war on the Catholic Church and anyone who spoke French. The latest arrivals were looking to control everything. From his cathedral in St. Boniface, Bishop Alexander Taché watches the steady influx of English Protestant settlers and worries about the growing hostility toward his Métis flock. Instead of being treated in a gentlemanly way, the Métis have suffered vulgarities and insults. A rude and disdainful, I don't talk French, is often the only reply to an honest question. Taché realizes that the Métis will soon be outnumbered, so he asks his old friend, Father Albert Lacombe, to go to Quebec and recruit French-speaking Catholic settlers. Lacombe will get a cool reception from Quebec politicians who worry about their declining population. Like the rest of Canada, Quebec families are leaving their homes in search of a better future. Thousands flee the Depression to find work in the booming textile mills of New England. They suffer insults from American bosses who call them the Chinese of the East because they will work long hours for little pay. But they stay and build churches to rival those they left behind in Quebec. These become the heart of the French-Canadian communities, what the Americans call the Little Canadas. It is to these parish churches that Father Lacombe comes in search of prospective settlers for Manitoba. We need French emigration if we are to preserve our heritage. An average of 40 families arrive there from Ontario each month. Will you let them take loan possession of a land that belongs as much to us as to them? Come to Manitoba. Another man is visiting the parish halls of the Little Canadas that year. He too is seeking colonists for the Red River settlements. His name, Louis Riel. Here, Riel is a hero, the man who stood up to the Canadian government in 1870, defending French Catholic rights in Manitoba. Everyone is for us wherever I go. There was a meeting of French Canadians here yesterday. They passed the most sympathetic resolutions for the Métis. But sympathy does not translate into settlers. Only a few families are willing to give up the life they know for the uncertainties of homesteading on the far-off prairie. Riel appears strong and confident, but this masks an inner turmoil. He has spent the last five years in exile, pursued by bounty hunters for the killing of an Ontario orangeman during the Red River resistance. Suffering from nervous exhaustion, Riel retreats deeper into his Catholic faith, convinced he has a mission from God to save his Métis nation and the Catholic religion in North America. 
When I speak to you, it is the voice of God that sounds, and everything I say is essential. I am the happy telephone who transmits to you the songs and messages of heaven. I help in a special way. When Riel begins calling himself a prophet of the new world, his friends are alarmed. They smuggle him back to Canada for medical treatment. He is diagnosed as suffering from megalomania and spends the next 21 months in Quebec insane asylums. His identity kept a secret. The self-proclaimed defender of the Métis people will not see his beloved Northwest for nearly a decade. When he does, Canada will be thrown into the gravest political crisis of the young country's history. Across the vast prairies, the Plains Indians watch as white settlers move onto their lands. Crowfoot is angry. White men have already taken the best locations and build houses in any place they please. American traders and others are farming large settlements on Belly River, the best winter hunting grounds. Surveyors, carving the prairies into quarter-mile sections, are stopped by Indian war parties. The Blackfoot, Blood, and Pagan plead for a treaty to protect them from the intruding settlers. We all see the day when the buffalo will be killed, and we shall have nothing more to live on. Then he will come to our camps and see the poor Blackfeet starving. On August 15, 1876, 2,000 Plains Cree are camped on the banks of the North Saskatchewan River, awaiting the arrival of Canada's treaty negotiators. Fearing unrest among the Indians, Alexander Morris, the new Lieutenant Governor of the Northwest Territories, is here to negotiate Treaty No. 6. We are brothers. I see Indians gathering. I see them receiving money from the Queen's commissioners to purchase clothing for their children. At the same time, I see them enjoying their hunting and fishing as before. I see them retaining their old mode of living with the Queen's gift in addition. The promises of money and gifts are enticing, but the Cree are uncertain. Can they trust the white man? One night before the negotiations began, a meteor was seen passing through the sky. Many see this as a warning not to take gifts in exchange for land given to them by the Creator. The Cree are deeply divided. A young chief named Poundmaker argues that white men have no right to take Cree land. The governor mentions how much land is to be given to us. He says 640 acres, one mile square for each family. This is our land. It isn't a piece of pemmican to be cut off and given back to us. It is our land and we will take what we want. Others see no choice. Star Blanket, an old and respected chief, counsels that a treaty is their only hope. Can we stop the power of the white man from spreading over the land like the grasshoppers that cloud the sky and then fall to consume every blade of grass and every leaf on the trees in their path? I think not. After days of negotiations, the chiefs finally accept.
promise of food in times of famine is the key issue. With the buffalo herds almost gone, the Cree fear starvation. The whole day was occupied with this discussion on the food question. It was the turning point with regard to the treaty. They were anxious to learn to support themselves by agriculture, and they dreaded that during the transition period they would be swept off by disease or famine. They seal the agreement with a prayer to the Creator, promising to honor the treaty and share the land and their future with the white man. They wear their treaty medals and treaty coats with pride, believing they have signed the treaty as equals. But they are wrong. Months earlier, the federal government passed the Indian Act, declaring all aboriginals to be wards of the state, like orphans and the infirm. From now on, their lives will be controlled by Ottawa. Crowfoot signs Treaty 7 a year later, and the Blackfoot, like the Cree, will soon learn the real meaning of the treaties. The staunch and noble ship of state His name is on the nation's lip And all who know him call him great And all who know him call him great The old chieftain is back. In 1878, after three summers campaigning around central Canada by train, Sir John A. Macdonald and his Conservative Party are swept back into power. Macdonald's campaign platform had been simple. Unemployment was caused by the Americans, whose unfair competition had crippled Canada's struggling factories. Macdonald convinced the voters that his national policy of protective tariffs would end the depression. We have announced our policy to be a protective policy in the interests of our native industries. I say if ever there was a time when it was expedient for a government to interfere, now is that time. Manufacturers wanted protection and supported McDonald's vision of the Northwest as the key to renewed prosperity. Eastern factories would churn out farm machinery that would make the Northwest the breadbasket of the British Empire, and tying it all together would be a transcontinental railway. Until that road is built, this dominion is a mere geographical expression and not one great dominion. Until bound by the Iron Link, we are not a dominion in fact. It would be nearly 3,000 miles long, constructed over some of the harshest terrain on Earth, making it the longest, most expensive line the world had ever seen. And MacDonald was asking a country barely 10 years old to complete it. In Winnipeg, news that the railway is coming sets off a frenzied economic boom. Contracts had already been let for half a million railroad ties, 6,000 telegraph poles, and 50,000 feet of pilings. Workmen were pouring into town, 300 from Montreal, 300 from Indianapolis, 500 teams of horses. Land fever sweeps through Winnipeg and across the northwest like a prairie storm. Sing a 
song of millions Spent like random shots Up in Manitoba Buying corner lots Winnipeg is called the Chicago of the North, a high-flying town of speculators, land sharks, and con men, all making money buying and selling land. Prices skyrocket. The Globe newspaper reports that land on Winnipeg's muddy Main Street costs more than real estate in downtown Toronto. If there ever was a fool's paradise, it sure was located in Winnipeg. Men made fortunes, mostly on paper, and life was one continuous joyride. The land craze rolls over everything in its path, including the Red River Métis, who were entitled to nearly a million and a half acres when Manitoba joined Confederation. Ottawa issued them scrip, each coupon good for 160 acres of land. But the impoverished Métis sell much of the scrip to speculators for a fraction of its value. William Alloway and his partner Henry Champion make enough money buying and selling Métis land and scrip to establish what becomes the largest private bank in Canada. Across the river in his St. Boniface Cathedral, Bishop Taché watches speculators taking the land he hoped to protect for French-speaking Catholics. The unfortunate Manitoba boom has gripped the Northwest, and many a greedy man sees it as the promised land for wealth he has not had to work for. The region is not ready for such large numbers of these men. Taché's concerns are drowned in the continuing flood of homesteaders. Mary Louisa Cummins and her husband had been ruined in the Depression. This was to be their new beginning. At the time, the CPR was plastering the country with fascinating pictures of glorious wheat fields on the great western prairies. There was a fortune for everyone in three years, well, not to mention glittering promises of practically free land. Hopes were high. So we, poor fools, fell into the trap. The settlers are about to discover that life on the prairies is more difficult than they ever believed. In 1881, the Canadian West is still one of the most isolated places to live in North America. A few pioneer settlements connected by rough wagon trails winding across the endless prairie. It is a six-week ordeal for Jenny Plaxton and her husband to travel from Winnipeg to their homestead near Prince Albert. Six weeks of bone-jarring ox carts and mosquitoes so thick they could kill. We traveled quite a distance when we met another couple, a bride and bridegroom. The bride was in torment with mosquitoes, just nearly crazed with them. She asked her husband to shoot her. He merely laughed. But one morning, the young wife found his revolver and shot herself. The poor woman was buried on the top of a hill where a wooden cross marks her grave. The railway promises to make traveling in the West easy. It will tame the prairie wilderness. In the spring of 1882, the first tracks west of the Red River Valley are being hammered onto the land. Sir John A. Macdonald is elated. 
from the United States, from Europe, and old Canada. That country is going to be populated by a large, industrious, and civilized race of people who will add to the strength and dignity of the Dominion. McDonald has authorized $25 million in public loan guarantees, enticing a private syndicate of bankers and railway men to build the Canadian Pacific. The CPR is also granted a 20-year monopoly to protect profits. The original route planned to link the pioneer settlements along the North Saskatchewan. But the first decision the CPR makes is to shift the line 200 miles south. The railway executives say this will make construction cheaper. The settlers are stunned. They were counting on the railway to bring boom times to their struggling communities. Trader Johnny McDougall and his new wife, Levisa, have just opened a store in Edmonton. Our first great disappointment was the change of route of the CPR, which carried the line 200 miles south. This was a severe and what many considered a knockout blow for Edmonton. The CPR has a powerful incentive to change the route. It was given 25 million acres of crown land to finance construction. Now it can dictate the location of new towns and sell off the surrounding real estate at high prices. The settlers soon discover that good homesteads near the railway are expensive. The cheap sections, advertised by the government, are a long, arduous cart ride away. Mary Louisa Cummins has traveled from London, England, to join her husband on their new homestead. The final leg of her trip is an exhausting eight-hour ride over nearly impassable trails. Then she sees her new home. I was about all in when we arrived at the homestead, and at the sight of the home I had come to, I burst into tears. Am I to live in that, I cried, quite forgetting how hard Colin must have worked to build that little wooden box. So, there we were. The immigration pamphlets never mention the intense loneliness experienced by many homesteaders. Hilda Kirkland's first winter was the hardest. I think the two words, silence and whiteness, will ever be associated in my mind. In those dreary winter months when almost all life had deserted the prairie, often the horizon was indistinguishable and one could not see where snow ended and the sky began. It seemed as there could be nothing but silence and whiteness in all the world. These early settlers face almost impossible hardships, plagues of grasshoppers, devastating prairie fires, unexpected killing frosts. Their disappointment and frustration begins to fester. Now they direct their bitterness against an increasingly indifferent government that had promised so much and seems to deliver so little. In 1884, it was as if a great prairie wind swept across the land, blowing away the promises and dreams of the Canadian West. Our big game is no more. You now own millions of acres and we have no food. We cannot work. We are tired. Feed us until we recoup our wasted bodies and then speak of labor. We are hungry. The Cree chief Big Bear has always opposed the treaties. Now his worst fears have come true. The buffalo have been decimated. 
American fur traders, Plains Indians, and white hunters all helped slaughter the four million buffalo which once roamed the Canadian prairie. The Plains Indians now depend on government rations, but in the House of Commons there is little sympathy for their plight and a demand that they work for their food. It is pretty evident that the Indians have become pensioners upon the public treasury, that we are called upon to feed them, to clothe them, and that they are doing little or nothing for themselves. Rations are continually reduced and distributed every other day, a policy the Indian agents call feed them one day, starve them the next. Sir John A. MacDonald approves. I have reason to believe that the agents as a whole are doing all they can by refusing food until the Indians are on the verge of starvation to reduce the expense. Between 1880 and 1885, an estimated 10% of the Plains Indians die of malnutrition and disease. A Winnipeg reporter describes the scene near one reserve. The bodies of the dead were strung up in trees, as is the Indian custom. Spring found some 50 or more ghastly corpses dangling from limbs of trees surrounding the teepees of the remaining members of the band. The settlers were struggling. The immigration pamphlets featured glowing reports of profits to be made. But wet springs and early autumn frosts devastate the crops. Harriet Neville and her husband are nearly bankrupt. He only had enough for next year's seed and the oats for feed. Now we were almost at the end of our resources. We believed part of what the settlers' pamphlets had told us, and as yet had no returns from the land. Many homesteaders are forced to abandon their farms, while in the small settlements, merchants are going broke. In schools and churches across the West, settlers hold meetings to vent their growing frustration. Many have no legal title to their farms because the land has still not been surveyed. There is a heavy federal tax on cheaper American farm equipment. But the deepest grievance is the lack of political power. The West is treated like a colony by distant Ottawa. William Jackson, a former Toronto University student, speaks at a meeting in Prince Albert. He reminds the settlers that other frustrated pioneers half a century earlier had been willing to fight for their rights. The best day that ever dawned for my native province of Ontario was that cold December morning of 1837 when William Lyon Mackenzie rebelled, when he took up arms in defense of our civil and religious liberties. Big Bear is also growing more desperate. In June 1884, he organizes a gathering of more than 2,000 Cree. He wants the chiefs to act together and force the government to live up to its treaty promises. The mounted police are sent in to break up the Cree Council. When the police attempt to arrest two warriors, the Cree resist. It is the first time a large force of mounted police have been openly challenged. Big Bear realizes that violence will ruin his attempts to negotiate with the government. When a struggle erupts, he prevents his young warriors from killing the police and even allows the men to be taken into custody. Leif Crozier, the police superintendent, is deeply shaken. 
He urges Ottawa to provide more food immediately. Otherwise, he fears he cannot control the increasingly hostile Indians. In their present temper, an attempt to arrest one of them or perform any duty not agreeable to them would lead to trouble again. For they seem to have made up their minds to resist any interference, even to the length of going to war. The main threat is Crowfoot. His warriors have tried farming, as the government wants, but without tools and the support promised in the treaties, it is hopeless. We try to do what the farm instructor has told us, and we are doing the best we can, but we need farm implements. I speak for my children and grandchildren, who will starve if they do not receive the help they so much need. Crowfoot's many warriors are well armed with modern rifles, and they are growing bolder, stealing cattle and government rations. In an effort to intimidate him, the government brings Crowfoot to Winnipeg. Crowfoot has never seen a city before. He is astonished by the towering brick buildings, the electric lights, and the huge white population. It is useless to rise up against the whites. They are as plentiful as the flies in summertime. But the possibility of an Indian uprising still terrifies the settlers and worries MacDonald. He sends more police west. But he fails to see another threat, the Métis. Few of them hold title to their land. Now government surveyors are cutting up their farm plots. They have seen this before. It's what caused the Red River resistance. The powerful Métis leader, Gabriel Dumont, has been looking for ways to put pressure on the government. Will Jackson, now Secretary of the Settlers' Union, invites the Métis to join them in a united front. For the first time, English-speaking farmers and the Métis draft resolutions outlining their common grievances. They agree they need a strong, decisive leader. Louis Goulet attends the meeting where Gabriel Dumont announces the name of the one man he knows the government dares not ignore. He spoke for a long time about the miseries and injustices the Metis had endured. Then Dumont explained, I want to tell you there's one man who can do what I want to do, and that's Louis Riel. Let's go and bring him back. Conditions are ripe for an explosion in the Northwest. Dashed hopes of the settlers, starvation and desperation among the Indians. And now the catalyst that will transform discontent into rebellion, the return of Louis Riel. Early in July, 1884, a Montana school teacher and his family quietly crossed the border into Canada at the request of a group of Métis and white settlers. I will accept your very kind invitation. The Canadian government owes me 240 acres of land. By petitioning the government with you, perhaps we will have the good fortune to obtain something. Louis Riel is back not to launch an armed revolt, but in hopes of peacefully obtaining a parcel of land he believes is his due. That will soon change. What begins as an attempt by frustrated Métis and white settlers to win land rights and political power will end in rebellion, massacre, and the gravest crisis in the young country's history. A 
Across the Northwest, there is growing talk of rebellion, but not from Louis Riel. It can be found in newspapers like Frank Oliver's Edmonton Bulletin. If history is to be taken as a guide, what could be plainer than without rebellion, the people of the Northwest need expect nothing, while with rebellion, successful or otherwise, they may reasonably expect to get their rights. At a public meeting in Prince Albert, 500 white settlers are surprised to hear Riel, the exiled leader of the Red River Resistance, urge them to negotiate peacefully with the federal government. Instead of wasting your time sending individual petitions, would it not be better to act together as one group? Gentlemen, do not compromise your rights. Protest if you are forced to, but do it within the limits of the law. In Ottawa, Prime Minister Macdonald is watching Riel's movements carefully. He fears Riel could be the catalyst uniting all the dissident groups in Saskatchewan. At this moment, Riel has gone into the Northwest. One cannot foresee what he may do or what they, under his advice, may do. We have certain uneasy elements. The Farmers' Union agitators, the French half-breeds, advised by Riel. Indian element, headed by such Indian loafers as Big Bear. McDonald's uneasy elements are already looking for ways to unite against him. Big Bear is invited to Prince Albert to meet Louis Riel. After years of poverty, Big Bear is overwhelmed by the abundance of food and other luxuries he sees in the home of Will Jackson's brother. Riel tries to persuade him to join the Métis and the Settlers' Union in a common front against the federal government. This is a nice house. These are nice things. But if you do as I tell you, you will have a grander house, better things, and plenty to eat. What I say to you, I say to all my brother chiefs, and I want you to tell them my words when you go back. But Big Bear's goal is a united Cree nation demanding the renegotiation of Treaty 6. An alliance with Riel is tempting, but after all he has been through, he cannot trust him or the Settlers' Union. In the Métis settlements along the South Saskatchewan River, there is unwavering support for Riel. Here he has established a solid base for his campaign against Ottawa. Back among his people, Riel's old passions are rekindled. He believes the Métis are a chosen people. My Lord Jesus Christ, I implore you, choose us the French-Canadian Métis and make us your favorite nation. The religious obsessions that brought him to an insane asylum in Quebec 15 years earlier are resurfacing. I am a prophet of the new world. Will Jackson, who is helping Riel draft a petition to the federal government on behalf of the Métis and the Settlers' Union, sees none of this. Louis Riel of Manitoba fame has united the half-breed elements solidly in our favor. His general bearing is frank and straightforward, indicating sincerity of purpose and assurance of his convictions. Riel's petition arrives in Ottawa in December and is promptly ignored. MacDonald doesn't realize that he has passed up his last opportunity to prevent rebellion. It is a long and bleak winter for Louis Riel. He is penniless, his family forced to accept charity. As the months drag on, Riel becomes increasingly militant. Now he is convinced that Ottawa has nothing to offer but bully tactics. 
The petitions sent to the government are not listened to. Moreover, the Dominion has taken the high-handed approach of answering peaceful complaints by reinforcing their mounted police. The Métis are determined to save their rights or die. Rumors spread that the police are about to arrest him. The Settlers' Union and even many of his Métis followers are becoming apprehensive. Riel is running out of time. In a fateful step, he declares an independent Métis state, its capital an obscure settlement named Batoche. This is a bargaining tactic intended to force MacDonald to negotiate. But MacDonald continues to ignore Riel. He is preoccupied with a more pressing crisis. The CPR is on the verge of bankruptcy. But the very day the CPR president tells him about the hopeless condition of the railway, something happens in Saskatchewan that changes the course of history. Duck Lake, a few miles from Batoche. 200 of Riel's Métis and a handful of Indians battle a column of 100 mounted police and civilian volunteers. The battle is not planned. But when heavily armed police and Métis fighters run into each other on the same road, a clash is inevitable. And when it is over, three police and nine civilian volunteers lie dead in the snow. Riel watches the battle on horseback, holding a wooden cross and praying aloud. He only wanted to get the government's attention and never planned to fight. Now fate has intervened. For a shaken Riel, the victory is a sign from God that his cause must be just. God has been pleased to grant us the victory. And as our movement is to protect our rights, our victory is just, and we offer it to the Almighty. But the victory is costly. The settlers have never supported armed rebellion. They terminate their alliance with the Métis. Riel is now alone with his prayers and his hopes that the Indians will join him. Back in Ottawa, MacDonald is calling out the militia and planning to use his new railway to rush them to the west. Across the Northwest Territories, in the nights leading up to the battle at Duck Lake, there was a spectacular display of northern lights. Star Blanket, a Cree chief, knew the meaning of their unusual color. Look, the light is red. Prepare to learn of pestilence and the shedding of blood. And the ghost dance is red. Misery is at hand. When Parliament is told of the defeat at Duck Lake, the first question is not about the Métis. Liberal leader Edward Blake wants to know about the Indians. What is the condition of the food supplies? It is very obvious that the possibility of the Indians taking an effective part in this unhappy business must greatly depend on the food supply. MacDonald's biggest worry is Crowfoot and his well-armed Blackfoot warriors. Riel has been sending messages asking them to join his rebellion. Orders are given to immediately increase the food rations. This insurrection is a bad business, but we must face it as best we may. The first thing to be done is to localize the insurrection. Reports of the Métis victory at Duck Lake 
spread quickly to all the settlements in the northwest. In Edmonton, a few minutes after the alarming news arrives, the telegraph line goes dead. Settlers prepare to abandon their homes for the security of the old Hudson's Bay fort. Here they find some old guns, but no ammunition. The men set to work making their own. There are 2,000 armed Cree warriors on the nearby reserves and no hope of outside support. Levisa McDougall finds herself with the other women fashioning crude cartridges out of cloth. We are living in the most intense excitement. We expect any hour to hear the Indians have broken out. Messengers have been sent from Rial to our Indians across the river, and word has been sent around to all the Indians north of us. Homesteaders flood in from the surrounding farms, bringing wild rumors to the already terrified settlers. Indians all around us were plundering and killing cattle, destroying everything they could not carry away. People had to run for their lives. The mails could not come or go, and no one dared travel far from home. The whole place, town and country, was completely paralyzed. But the next flashpoint of the Northwest Rebellion is not Edmonton. It's an isolated settlement 100 miles down the North Saskatchewan called Frog Lake. Big Bear and his band are camped nearby. The old chief had urged his people not to join the rebellion, believing that only diplomacy would protect his people. But now he is undermined. When news of the fight at Duck Lake reached us, my band ignored my authority and despised me because I did not side with the half-breeds. A warrior's council takes control of the band, then rides into Frog Lake to demand food. When the local Indian agent refuses, he is shot. The warriors loot the settlement. Ignoring Big Bear's pleas, they murder nine settlers, including two priests. Louis Goulet, who was taken prisoner by the warriors, witnessed the attack. I could hear gunshots and whoops coming from everywhere. The engines were drunk with ferocity. I saw Father Marchand, one of the two priests, fall on his knees, arms crossed, yes, raised to heaven. He was gone down on the spot. I never saw him move again. The murders at Frog Lake electrify the country. Newspapers print lurid and wildly exaggerated accounts of a massive Indian uprising. From Halifax to Winnipeg, young men eager to defend their country rush to the drill halls. The volunteer soldiers of Canada's first national army march to the railroad stations anticipating epic battles and great victories. In less than a fortnight, militia units from Ontario and Quebec arrive in Winnipeg on troop trains hastily assembled by the CPR. McDonald's Railway is proving its worth. Far to the south of Batoche, one crucial question remains. Will Crowfoot join Riel's rebellion? There are chiefs who are ready to fight. But Crowfoot remembers the throngs of white men he had seen in Winnipeg. He knows that thousands of soldiers are coming and he had been given more food rations. Crowfoot makes up his mind. His decision is telegraphed to Ottawa and read aloud in the House of Commons. 
I wish to send to you the words I have given at a council at which all my minor chiefs and young men were present. We are agreed and determined to remain loyal to the Queen. Crowfoot's pledge of loyalty is a godsend for MacDonald. A full-scale Indian uprising has been avoided. Now he can concentrate on the trouble spots along the Saskatchewan. The stage is set for a showdown with Louis Riel at Batoche. It has taken almost a month, but Canada's volunteer army is at last on the Saskatchewan Plains. The final act of the Northwest Rebellion is about to begin. In command of the troops is General Frederick Middleton. He was a former British officer with a typical disdain for colonial troops made worse when he watched their target practice. After the drill was over, I went down the ranks of the 90th and questioned each man and found that many of them had never fired a rifle. Some had never fired any weapon at all. This was not a cheerful outlook after receiving a telegram dwelling on the excellence of the shooting of the half-breeds. Middleton moves cautiously. He sends one column of troops to Calgary then north to protect Edmonton and to hunt for Big Bear. A smaller column is sent to relieve Fort Battleford, where settlers have taken refuge, fearing an attack by Chief Poundmaker's warriors. Middleton leads the main force on a 200-mile march to Batoche. Gabriel Dumont, the Métis military commander, is waiting for him. My plan was to go out and meet the enemy, because they were already showing weakness by hesitating to advance. I wanted to get behind them, kill them, and take their guns. That was always my first thought, to get more guns. The first skirmish is near a coulee called Fish Creek. Hidden in the dense thickets, Dumont launches an ambush. Father Fourmont, who is helping Métis families flee, fears the worst. We hear clearly the cannon and the gunfire that announced they were seriously engaged in combat. We experience pangs of anguish. Sadness overcomes all of us at the thought of our dear Métis, perhaps being decimated by the enemy's grape shot and hail of bullets. But Dumont's fighters are holding their own. Despite superior firepower, Middleton's troops cannot break through the Métis defenses. Other officers and men were now very anxious to be allowed to again try and rush the rifle pits. But I had already lost too many of my citizen soldiers and did not think it advisable to risk losing more, as we certainly should have done in the second attempt. But the small Métis army cannot hold off the Canadians indefinitely. A desperate Riel continues his appeal for Indian reinforcements. Indians of Battleford, rise up and face the police. If it has not yet been done, take Battleford. Destroy. Come to join us. You can easily send us 40 or 50 men. Poundmaker's camp is only a few days' ride from Batoche. His Cree warriors had fought off a surprise attack by Middleton's troops sent to protect Battleford, but Poundmaker had refused to go on the offensive. I did everything to stop bloodshed. If I had not done so, there would have been plenty of blood spilled this summer. I have saved the lives of many. But his young warriors have tasted victory and want to join Riel. 
Poundmaker still refuses to get involved in the rebellion. Riel and the Métis are now alone. In Batash, Riel sinks deeper into his religious mania. He prays so long that he needs help holding his arms in the shape of a cross. He wants to rename the days of the week. He believes God wants him to appoint a new pope. His increasingly bizarre beliefs alarm the only white man to join his rebellion, Will Jackson. Mr. Riel proposed himself to me as the prophet of the new world. I concluded that Mr. Riel was presumptuous and wrong. I wrote that I could not accept his mission. Jackson will not abandon Riel, but many of the Batash Métis are unnerved by his growing obsessions. If we're fighting, it's not over religion, but over our rights. You came here to protect our rights, and all you talk about is religion. The ambush at Fish Creek has only slowed the Canadians. Now they resume their advance. I have seen the giant. He is coming. He is Goliath. Oh my God, grant us the favor so that we beat them one after another. One gun ready! Number one, fire! In the first week of May, the Canadians reach the outskirts of Batoche. Once again, the embattled Métis hold out against superior numbers and overwhelming firepower, including the first use of the Gatling gun. Sergeant Walter Stewart admires their courage. Our whole line extended a full mile. At this point, the Indians and half-breeds put up their real fighting, running from rifle pit to rifle pit, firing as they went, stubbornly contesting every foot of ground. Finally, after three days of fierce resistance, the Métis are overwhelmed. Gabriel Dumont fights to the very end. We had no more ammunition. The troops advanced and our men came out of their trenches. It was then they were killed. The balance sheet of these four days of desperate fighting was for us. Three wounded and 12 dead, as well as a child killed. The only victim of the famous Gatling gun. Riel, Dumont, and what remains of the Métis forces escape. Robert Allen is among the Canadian troops who ransack Batoche. Our men have been pillaging. Each man has something he intends to keep as a souvenir. The Métis wanted nothing more than recognition of their rights as citizens of Canada's Northwest. Their hope ended at Batoche in tragedy and degradation. The Northwest Rebellion has been crushed. Three days later, Louis Riel surrenders. A triumphant Middleton telegraphs MacDonald. Riel is my prisoner. What is to be done with him? I await instructions here. Poundmaker, whose warriors defeated the Canadians near Fort Battleford, voluntarily disarms his men as General Middleton requests. Two months later, Big Bear comes out of hiding and surrenders. Like the majority of the Cree, he insists he had not rebelled. The troops return home to a hero's welcome. There are medals for all, 
and no one seems to care that millions of dollars were spent putting down a rebellion that could have been avoided. MacDonald is elated. Canada is delirious with enthusiasm upon the return of our volunteers. This has done more to weld the provinces into one nation than anything else could have done. But MacDonald's dreams of unity will soon evaporate. For even in defeat, Riel has the power to tear the country apart. After the fall of Batoche, police and militia round up anyone suspected of taking part in the rebellion, including Will Jackson and Louis Goulet. We found ourselves with everybody who'd taken part in the rebellion one way or another. There was Riel and his consul, the people who were at Duck Lake, Fish Creek, Batoche, as well as Indians who'd taken part in the uprising, and others who'd been attacked. Poundmaker and his band. The prison was full to overflowing. Life is returning to normal in the settlements. Johnny McDougall's store in Edmonton does a brisk business resupplying homesteaders who had spent many anxious weeks waiting for the Indian uprising. Yet like many of the settlers, McDougall remains sympathetic to the plight of the Indians. The Hudson's Bay Company had no right to sell this country. It belonged to the Indians. And the government, since getting their country, has not treated them right. There is general dissatisfaction among all the classes of people in this country against the government, and for many good reasons. At Mounted Police Headquarters in Regina, Canada's most infamous rebel is shackled to the wall of a tiny wooden cell. Louis Riel remains defiant. He plans to vindicate himself in a spectacular trial he wants held in Quebec. I was not taken prisoner. I surrendered on purpose. I want to be judged on the merits of my actions. From the time of my arrival in Saskatchewan, I worked peacefully. We didn't make any aggressive military moves. In Batoche, we defended ourselves. Sir John A. Macdonald has no intention of creating a grandstand for the man who has led two armed uprisings. He wants Riel hanged. That cannot be guaranteed under Canadian law, so he resorts to an ancient British charge of high treason. It prescribes only one penalty, death. There is another problem. The trial is to be heard in the Manitoba Superior Court, but Alexander Campbell, the federal justice minister, is told that in Manitoba, half the jurors could be Métis. The jury in Winnipeg would be composed of 12, of whom the prisoner might insist that moiety be half-breeds. In Regina, however, the prisoner would not be entitled to a mixed jury. The trial is quietly moved. There is an almost carnival atmosphere in the tiny settlement of Regina. Hotels are packed with officials and lawyers. There are newspapermen from around the world. The curious line up for hours, paying $10 for a chance to watch the biggest trial in Canadian history. It is a sweltering July morning when Louis Riel is brought into the prisoner's box. His trial is conducted in a simple magistrate's court with a part-time judge. The jury is made up of six men. Only one speaks any French. Order. Order. 
Riel's lawyers argue that a man who calls himself a prophet of God, who wants to choose a new pope and move the seat of the Catholic Church to Canada, is clearly insane and therefore not responsible for his actions. Riel insists otherwise. I suppose that after having been condemned, I will cease to be called a fool. And for me, it is a great advantage. I have a mission. I cannot fulfill my mission as long as I'm looked upon as an insane being. If I am guilty of high treason, I say that I am a prophet of the new world. Despite his extravagant rhetoric, Riel impresses the jury as respectful, entertaining, and perfectly sane. Will Jackson is also on trial in the Regina courtroom. His lawyer also pleads insanity, and like Riel, Jackson disagrees. I have always declared myself perfectly responsible. That is to say, as Riel's secretary, and I wish to share his fate, whatever that may be. But a string of witnesses, including his brother, have no difficulty convincing a Protestant jury that a white Methodist settler who joined the Métis Rebellion and converted to Catholicism could be nothing but insane. Jackson is committed to the Selkirk Lunatic Asylum in Manitoba, but manages to escape to the United States a few months later. It takes the jury barely an hour to reach a verdict on Riel. Guilty with a recommendation for mercy. But on August 3, 1885, the judge ignores their plea and sentences him to death. The verdict is applauded in Ontario and condemned in Quebec. Will Jackson, the English Protestant, is spared. Riel, symbol of the hopes of French Catholics in the West, will hang. For Quebec, this is not justice. Riel is condemned to be hanged. We can't be surprised. The whole thing was arranged from the beginning. Upper Canada needed a scapegoat. There is mounting pressure in Quebec to commute Riel's sentence. But if he agrees, MacDonald fears he will lose Ontario. An MP warns him, if Riel is not hanged, we will never poll another conservative vote. MacDonald must gamble. The conviction of Riel is satisfactory. There is an attempt in Quebec to pump up a patriotic feeling about him, but I don't think it will amount to much. He could not have been more wrong. November 7th, 1885. Sir John A. Macdonald's dream of a Canadian railway stretching from sea to sea has come true. But instead of rejoicing, Macdonald is trying to contain a political crisis over the hanging of Riel. He is even receiving death threats. Riel's execution draws closer. The Conservative Party is in turmoil. Joseph Adolphe Chaplot, a key Quebec cabinet minister, prepares to resign, but after a long night of soul searching, he decides this will only inflame the situation. Suddenly I saw in front of me such a sight of tumult, fighting, bloodshed, misery. I saw the isolation of French Canada and racial hatred provoking retaliation, fighting and disaster. I was horrified. Chaplot agrees to stay. The cabinet closes ranks and votes to proceed with the hanging. MacDonald is defiant. He shall hang, though every dog in Quebec bark in his favor.
November 16, 1885. The dawn breaks clear and bright over Regina. In his cell at Mounted Police Headquarters, Riel writes his last letters and in the company of two priests says his final prayers. For 15 years they have pursued me in their hate and never yet have they made me waver. Today still less when they lead me to the scaffold. And I'm infinitely grateful to them for releasing me from this dreadful captivity that weighs on me. The sheriff, a French Canadian, refuses to deliver the execution order. So at the appointed hour, an English-speaking deputy escorts Riel to the gallows. Watching is a reporter from the Regina Leader. Father McWilliams, his stole over his overcoat, led the procession out of the cell. He was followed by Riel, carrying a small ivory crucifix set in silver. Behind him came the Northwest Mounted Police in red tunics. The small procession climbs the stairs to the gallows. Beneath the platform, two doctors and George Ham of the Toronto Mail wait as the Lord's Prayer is recited. The hangman sprang the bolt at 28 minutes past eight and Riel shot downward with a terrible crash. For a second, he did not move. A slight twitching of the limbs was noticed, but instantly, all was still again. In two minutes after the fall, Louis Riel was no more. Word of the hanging is quickly telegraphed across the country. The reaction in Quebec is swift. They hanged him. It was 11.12 in the morning when the cursed telegram arrived in Montreal. Ten minutes later, all Montreal knew the news and all activity was suspended. Everywhere we heard, they hanged him. Poor Riel is dead. Public meetings are called. Students march through the streets shouting a protest song set to the tune of the Marseillaise. What do these slave masters want, they sing? Who do these orange men conspire against? They'd like to see us in our coffins, these tyrants whose insane arrogance blinds them and makes them deaf to our prayers. McDonald's Quebec ministers, especially Chaplot, are branded as murderers and traitors. Pictures of Riel draped in black appear in shop windows. The song ends with these words. Children, hold on to the memory of these three cursed ministers. They are traitors. Let's get rid of these infidels. In Montreal, 50,000 people jam the Champ de Mar to condemn Riel's execution. MacDonald is burned in effigy before the cheering crowd. Across English-speaking Canada, jubilant crowds celebrate Riel's death. Anti-French demonstrations are encouraged by newspaper editorials appealing to prejudice and hatred. We are sick of the French Canadians with their patriotic blabber. As far as we are concerned, Quebec could go out of Confederation tomorrow and we would not shed a tear, except for joy. Attacks by the Quebec Liberals, the Rouge, are weakening the Conservative Party. MacDonald now realizes that Riel will continue to haunt him. The triumph of the Rouge over the corpse of Riel changes affairs completely. It will encourage the opposition, dispirit our friends, and will, I fear, carry the country against us at the general election. MacDonald will win the next federal election, but his hold on Quebec has been broken. Never again can he count on the one province that had always supported him. A 
Out on the Western Plains, the final chapter of the rebellion is coming to an end. Eleven days after Riel's death, another gallows is erected. Eight Indians, six of them warriors from Big Bear's band, are executed for murders committed during the rebellion. They are hanged at Fort Battleford, barely 60 miles from where the Cree had signed Treaty 6 nine years earlier. Another 50 Indians are sentenced to prison terms, including Cree chiefs Poundmaker and Big Bear. Despite evidence that they helped prevent an Indian uprising, both are convicted of treason and sent to prison. The two chiefs die shortly after being released. Life for the Plains Indians has changed forever. A Cree chief named Foremost Man cries for a time that will never return. Let them take back the blankets and return the buffalo robes. Let them send the buffalo back and take their own people to the reserve where they came from. Give us the prairie again and we won't ask for food, but it is too late. The iron road has frightened the game away and the talking wire stretches from sunrise to sunset. It is too late. It is too late. On a cold December evening, a train rushes through the prairie night, bound for Winnipeg. Two Métis guards accompany the casket containing the body of Louis Riel. He is brought back to his family on board the CPR, symbol of the new power in the new West. In the summer of 1886, the great dream has become reality. Twice a week, a CPR train leaves Montreal's Dalhousie Station for Port Moody, British Columbia, crossing the vast continental territory of Canada. One year after the rebellion, Sir John A. Macdonald and his wife bore the CPR president's lavish carriage, taking his first trip to see the territory he and Riel fought over. Macdonald has managed to get his railway built. Only he knows how much Riel helped him do it. With respect to the character given to the outbreak, we have certainly made it assume large proportions in the public eye. This has been done, however, for our own purposes, and I think wisely done. The new homesteaders flock to the tiny stations along the CPR to catch a glimpse of their famous prime minister. But there are no celebrations in the pioneering towns along the North Saskatchewan that the railway has bypassed. They are in decline. In Edmonton, Johnny McDougall and the other merchants must pay the expenses of new homesteaders themselves to keep the town from dying out. Both the government and the CPR seem to be working against us. They certainly did little for us. We fought, worked, and paid for everything we got from them. Antagonism between settlers and the federal government continues to simmer but the settlement becomes a town and finally gets its own connection to the railway. Johnny McDougall becomes mayor of Edmonton and one of its earliest millionaires. McDonald and his entourage visit Regina and Medicine Hat and then stop at Gleeshan Station east of Calgary. The Blackfoot are waiting for him. 
McDonald brings gifts, including a fancy suit for Crowfoot, the man who more than anyone else prevented an Indian uprising during the rebellion. Crowfoot accepts the gifts with dignity, but what he really wants is what he has been asking for since the treaties were signed, food for his people. My chiefs fear for their children. That food would not be given them. I ask you, Sir John, to help banish these fears. MacDonald refers all questions about rations to the territory's lieutenant governor. Then he and his wife board the train for Victoria. There will be no renegotiation of the treaties. The Plains Indians become subsistence farmers controlled by the Department of Indian Affairs. Children are forcibly taken from their parents and confined in distant residential schools. Their native language and culture banned. The great aim of our legislation has been to do away with the tribal system and assimilate Indian people in all respects with the inhabitants of the Dominion as speedily as they are fit for the change. Crowfoot dies in 1890. Only four of his 12 children reach maturity. The rest die of tuberculosis and diseases brought on by poverty and malnutrition. The Métis fare no better. They bury their dead and their hopes at the Patoche Cemetery. By 1894, local legislatures in Manitoba and the Northwest Territories have abolished all guarantees for the Catholic religion and French language. MacDonald is brutally frank about English dominance in the West. The people of Quebec will not migrate in that direction. The consequence is that Manitoba and the Northwest Territories are becoming what British Columbia is, wholly English, with English laws, British immigration, and, I may add, English prejudices. This is the only trip MacDonald makes to the West, the only time he ever sees the land he has gambled so heavily on. He will die five years later on June 6, 1891. Canada's founding prime minister helped forge a country from a continent-sized wilderness and a handful of disparate colonies. The massive plains and graceful valleys of the Northwest Territories have been taken at great cost but now stand ready to play their part in a country that stretches from sea to sea. The settlers will learn to make the fertile land yield the bountiful harvests they have dreamed of. Families will set down roots and prosper, their ranks soon to swell with a tidal wave of immigration that will continue for a generation. The Northwest, which only 20 years ago belonged to the Prairie Indians, is now home to a new people. They make a powerful imprint upon the land. Their journey is gathering speed, moving swiftly towards the 20th century and Canada's destiny.